One Other by Manly Wade Wellman. Why they're named that. If the Gardinal's an old folk's tale, I must to tell you it's a true one. Few words about them are best, I should reckon. They look some way like a shed, or a cabin, snug and rightly made. Except the open door might could be a mouth, the two little windows might could be eyes. Never you'll see one on main roads or near towns, only back in the thickety places, by high trails among tall ridges. And they show themselves there when it rains and storms and a lone farer hopes to come to a house to shelter him. The few that's lucky enough to have gone into a gardenal and went out again, helped, maybe, by friends with axes and corn knives to chop in, to them. Tell that inside, it's panky walled and dippy floored. With on the floor, all the skulls and bones of those who never did went out. And from the floor and the walls come spouting rivers of white juice that stains. And as they tell this, why, all at once, you know that inside a gardenal is like a stomach. Down the lowlands I've seen things grow they named the venous flytrap and the pitcher plant that can toll in bugs and flies to eat. It's just a possible chance that the gardenal is some way the same species, only it's so big it can toll in people. Gardenal. Why they're named that, I can't tell you, so don't inquire me. Up on Hark Mountain, I climbed all alone by a trail as steep as a ladder and no way near as easy to hold to. Under my old army shoes was sometimes mud, sometimes rock, sometimes rolling gravel. I laid hold on laurel and oak scrub and sourwood and dogwood to help me get up to the steepest places. Sweat soaked the back of my hickory shirt through and hung under the band of my old hat. Even my silver-strung guitar, bouncing on its slang cord behind me, felt as weighty as an anvil. Hark Mountain is not the highest I ever went up. But it's sure enough one of the steepest. I reckoned I was getting up close to the top when I heard a murmuring voice up there, a young sounding woman's voice. All at once she yelled out a name, and that name was mine. John, she said, and murmured lower again, and then, John. Gentlemen, you can wager I was purely sailed up to the last stretch of that trail on my hands and knees to the very top. On top of Hark Mountain's tipmost top was a pool. Hush, gentlemen, without airy stream or draw or branch to feed it. Where no pool should be aught by nature to be expected, there was clear blue pool, bright looking, but not just exactly sweet looking. The highest place on Hark Mountain wasn't any much bigger than a well-sized farmyard, and it had room for hardly the pool and its rim of tight-set rocks, and the trees that grew betwixt those tight rocks at the rim looked leafless and gnarly, but alive. Their branch twigs crimped and crooked like claw nails ready to seize on something. Almost in reach of me by the edge of the pool burnt a fire, and to tend it, kneeled down a girl. 
She was a tall girl, but not strong built like country girls. She was built slim, like town girls, and she wore town clothes, a white blouse shirt, and dark pants tied to her long legs all the way up and down, and soft shoes like slippers on her feet. Her arms and neck were as brown as nut meat, the way fashionably women seek to be brown. Around her head was tied a blue silk handkerchief. Kneeling, she put a tweak of stuff on the fire, and I saw her long, sharp red fingernails. She spoke again, sang it almost, and my name rose out of what she said. It is the bones of John that I trouble. I, for John, burn this laurel. On the fire, she put some laurel leaves, and they sent up steam. Even as it crackles and burns, even thus may the flesh of John burn for me. Then went something else. Even as I melt this wax with one other to aid me, so speedily may John, for love of me, be melted. She took up a little clay pot and dripped something. Dripped. The fire danced. Dripped. It danced again, jumping up. Drip, a third jump up, dancing flame. Thrice I pour libation, she said. Thrice, by one other, I say this fail. Be it with a friend he tarries, with a woman he lingers, may John utterly forget and forsake them. Then she stood up, slim and tall, and held on to something red and wavy that I knew. This from John I took, and now I cast it into... But Quick and quiet, I was close beside her, and I snatched that red scarf away. It's been wondering me where I might could have lost that, I said, and she turned and faced me. Just some slight bit, I felt I knew her from somewhere. She was yellow-haired, blue-eyed, brown-faced. She had a little bitty nose and a mouth as red as red wine. Her blue eyes widened out almost as wide as the blue pool itself, and she smiled. Her teeth were big and white and even in her smile. John, she said my name softer, halfway singing it to me. I was saying the spell for the third time, and you came here to my call. She licked those red lips of hers, and they shone just the way Mr. Housen promised you'd come. I never let on to know who Mr. Housen might possibly be. I, weighed, I wadded up the red scarf into the hip pocket of my blue jeans pants. Why were you witch-spelling me, I inquired her. What did I ever do to you? I even disremember where it was I met you. You don't remember me, she said, smiling. But you do remember Enderby Lodge, John? Why, sure. A month back, I'd strolled through these parts with my guitar. Old Major Enderby had bade me rest in my hat a while. He was having a dance, and to pleasure him and his guests, I'd picked and sung for him. You must have been there, I said. But what was it I did to you? Her lips tightened, and now they looked as red and hard and sharp as her painted nails. Nothing at all, John, she told me. Not a thing. You did nothing. You ignored me. Doesn't it make you furious to be ignored? Ignored? No, ma'am, it never makes me furious, or I'd be furious a big part of the time. Makes me furious. I don't often look at a man twice, and usually they look at me at least once. I don't forgive being ignored. Again, she licked her mouth, like a cat over a basin of milk. I've been told my charm can be said three times besides the bottomless pool on Hark Mountain to burn a man's soul with love, and here you came when I called you. Don't shake your head like that, John. You're in love with me. I'm sorry, ma'am. I ask your pardon humbly. I'm not in love with you any such thing. 
She smiled in pride and scorn, the smile you'd give to a liar. But you climbed up Hark Mountain to me. I reckon I'd like to have a look at the bottomless pool. People don't know the bottomless pool is up here. Only Mr. Housen and his sort come here. When you talk about bottomless pools, you mean the ones near Lake Lure on Highway 74. Those aren't rightly bottomless, I said. Anyway, this one, this real one, is sung in a country song. Pulling my guitar around. I picked chords and sang. Way up on Hark Mountain, I climb all alone. Where the trail is untraveled, the top is unknown. Way up on Hark Mountain is the bottomless pool. You look in its water and it shows you a fool. You're making that up, she charged me. No, ma'am, it was made up long before my daddy's daddy was born. Most country songs have got truth in them. It was the song fetch me here, not your witch spell. She laughed, short and sharp, yet almost yelped in her laugh. Call it the long arm of coincidence, John. You're here anyway. Go look in the water and see whether it shows you a fool. Plainly, she didn't know the next verse, so I sang that too. You can boast of your knowledge and brag of your sins. It won't make no difference a hundred years hence. Stepping one foot onto a, stepping one foot on a rock of the rim, I looked down. The water didn't show me a fool, nor either a wise man. I could see down forever, and forever. And I recollected all I'd ever heard tell about the bottomless pool. How it was as blue as the blue sky, but it had a special light of its own. How no water ever ran into it, excusing some rain, but it always stayed full. How you couldn't measure its bottom. If you let down a sinker on a line, it would go down till the line broke of its own weight. Though I couldn't spy out the bottom, it wasn't rightly dark down there. Like a man looking up into the blue sky, I looked down into the blue water, and in the blue, far away down, was a many-colored shine, like lights deeper than I can tell you. I didn't need to use that stolen scarf, she said at my elbow. You're lying about why you came here. My spell brought you. I'm sorry to say, ma'am, I replied. I can't even call your name to my mind. Do names make a difference if you love me? Call me Anna Linda. I'm rich. I've been loved for that alone. And for myself alone. Well... I'm plain and poor, I told her. I was raised hard and put up wet. I don't have every cent of money in these old clothes of mine. It sure enough wonders me, Miss Anna Linda, why you think you need to bother yourself about me. I'm just not used to being ignored, she said again. Down there in the bottomless pool's blueness wasn't a fish or a weed of grass. Only that deep away sparkly flash of lights changing as you see changes on a bubble of soap blown by a little baby child. Somebody cleared his throat and said, See the spell I gave you worked, ma'am. I knew Mr. Housen as he came up the trail to the top of Hark Mountain. He was purely ugly. I had been known him ten years, and he looked as ugly that minute as the first time I'd seen him, with his mean face and his great big hungry nose and the black patch over one eye. When he had his two eyes, they were put so close together in his head that you'd be sworn he could look through a keyhole with the two of them at once. Yes, Miss Anna Linda. I want to pay you what I owe you. No, ma'am. You pay one other said Mr. Housen. 
and put his hands in the pockets of the long black coat he wore summer and winter. For value received, ma'am. I only passed along his word to you. He tightened his lips at me, and what wasn't anything like a smile. John, he said, you relish journeying. You've relished it ever since you was just a chap. Going where you felt like going. You've seen a right much of this world, but she told you to her, and now you'll stay with her. And for that, you can be obliged to one other. One other what? I inquired him. Though that was just a defy at him. Of course, a hearing of Hark Mountain in the bottomless pool. I'd sure enough heard of one other. How mountain folks swear he's got the one arm and the one leg only that he runs fast on the one leg and grabs hold with the one arm and whatever he grabs goes with him into the bottomless pool and that it's one other's power and knowledge that lets witches do their spells up here by the bottomless pool. Be here with the lady when one other asks payment, said Mr. Housen. That there spell was good a many years before Theocritus written it down in Old Greek. It'll still be good in English writing is as old as Greek writing. Told you here. But for the life of me, I couldn't recollect seeing Miss Anna Linda at Mr. and Major Enderby's. My own wish and will brought me here. Not hers, I said. I wanted to see the bottomless pool. I wanted at the soap bottle color in it. Ain't soap in there, John, said Mr. Housen. Soap bottles don't ever get so big as to have that much color. You rightly sure about how big soap bottles get, Mr. Housen, I asked. Once I heard a science doctor say how this whole life of ours, the heaven and the earth, the sun and moon and stars and all may be holding a shape like a big soap bubble. He said it stretched and spread like a soap bubble. With all the suns and stars and worlds getting further off, part as time passes. Both of you stay here where you are, Mr. Housen Bayless. One other's going to want to find the both of you here. But, Miss Anna Linda made out to begin. Both of you stay, Mr. Housen said again. And with his shoe toe, he scuffed a mark across the head of the trail. Then he hopped and spat on the mark. Don't cross that line. It'd be worse for you than if a fire burnt you behind and before, inside and out. Like a lizard, he bobbed over the edge and away down the trail. Let's us go too, I said to Miss Anna Linda. But she stared at the mark made by Mr. Housen's shoe, and the healthy blood had paled out from under the tan on her face. Pay him no mind, I said. Let's start. It's coming on the sunset. He said not to cross the mark, she reminded me, scared. I don't care a shuck for all he said. Come on, Miss Anna Linda. I took her by the arm. That quick I had her to a fight. Holding her arm was like holding the spoke of a runaway wheel. Her other hand came up and her sharp red nails raked hide and blood off my cheek. And she tried to bite. I couldn't hold her without hitting her. So I turned her loose, and she sat down on a rock by the poolside and cried into her hands. I'll have to go alone, I said, and took a step. John, she called, loud and shaky as a horse's whinny. If you step across that mark, I'll throw myself into this bottomless pool. 
Sometimes you can tell when a woman means the thing she says. This was one of those times. So I walked back to her, and she was looking to where the down-sinking sun made the edge of the sky turn red and fiery. It would be cold and dark when that sun was gone. With trembling hands, she smoothed the tight pants tighter to her legs. I'll just build up a fire, I said. I tried to break off a branch from a claw-looking tree, but it was tough and had thorny stickers. So I went to the edge of the open place off of where Mr. Housen had drawn his mark on us and gathered up an armful of dead fallen wood. I brought it back and freshened the fire she made for her witching. It blazed up, red, the color of the sun that sank down. High in the sky that turned pale before it would turn dark slid a great big old buzzard. Its wings flopped, slow and heavy, spreading out their feathers like long fingers. You don't believe all this, John, said Miss Aunt Linda, in a voice that sounded as if she was just before freezing from the cold. But the spell was true. The rest of it's true, too. About one other. He must have been here since the beginning of time. No. That's one thing peculiar enough to be the truth, I answer here. There's not so much been told about one other since this last year or so. About his being here at the bottomless pool. Or about folks being able to do witch things with his help. Or how he aids the witches and takes payment for his aid. It's no old country tale. It's right new and recent. Payment, she said after me. What kind of payment? I poked up the fire. That all depends. Sometimes one other takes one thing, sometimes another. You'll notice how Mr. Housen goes around with only the one eye. I heard it said that one other took an eye from him. Maybe he won't want an eye from you. He'll want something. Something for nothing. What do you mean? And she frowned her brows at me. You put a witch spell on me to make me love you. But you don't love me. You did it for spite. Not love. Why? Why? Nothing devils a woman like being caught in the truth. She laid hold on a poleside rock next to her. That will smash my head, or either my guitar, I gave her a quick word. Smash my head and you're up here on the mountain, all alone with a dead corpse. Smash my guitar and I'll go right down the trail. And I'll jump into the pool. All right, you can jump. I won't stay where folks fling rocks at me. Fair warning's as good as a promise. She let go of the rock again. She was ready to start crying. I came and set my foot at the edge of the pool and looked down into the water. By now, the sky was getting purely dark, but low and down and away was that so bubble shiny light. I brought back to mind an old tale they said came from the Indians who owned the mountains back before the first white folks came. It was about people living above the sky and thinking their world was the only one till somebody pulled up a great long root through the hole, they could see down to another world below, where people lived. Then Miss Aunt Linda began to talk. She was talking for the company of her own voice, and she talked about herself, about her rich father, 
and her rich mother, and all her rich aunts and uncles, and rich friends, the money, and automobiles, and land, and horses they own, and the big chance of men who wanted to marry her. One was the son of folks as rich as her folks. One was the governor of the state, who was ready to put away his wife if Miss Anna Linda said the word should have him. And one was a new noble-born man from a foreign country. And you'd marry me too, John, she said. I'm just sorry to death, I said, but I shouldn't. Now you're lying, John. I never lie, Miss Anna Linda. Everybody lies. Well, talk to me anyway. This isn't any sort of place to keep quiet in. So I talked in my turn about myself, how I'd been born next to Drowning Creek and baptized in its waters, how my folks had died in two days of each other, how an old teacher lady had taught me how to read and write, and I'd taught myself how to play the guitar, how I'd roamed and rambled, how I'd fought in the war, and a thousand had fallen at my side and ten thousand at my right side, and my right hand but it hadn't come up nigh me. I left out some things, like meeting up with the ugly bird, because she was nervous enough. I said that though I'd never had aught and never rightly expected to have aught, yet I'd always made out for bread to eat and sometimes butter on it. How about pretty girls, John? She asked me. You must have had regiments then. Not to mention, I said. For it wouldn't have been a proper dimension. Miss Annalinda, it's getting full, don't it? And the moon's up. No, ma'am. That's the soap bubble line from down there in the bottom of the spool. You make me shiver, she scolded at me, and drew up her shoulders. What do you mean with all this talk about soap bubbles? Only just what I was telling Mr. Housen. That science man said our whole life, what he calls our universe, was swelling and stretching out so that suns and moons and stars pull further apart all the time. He said our world and all the other worlds are inside that stretching skin of suds that makes the bubble. We can't study what's outside the bubble. Or either inside, only just what's in the suds part. It sounds crazyish, but when he talked, it sounded true. That's not a new idea, John. James Jeans wrote a book about it, the expanding universe. But where's the soap bubble come from? I reckon that whoever made all things must have blown it from a bubble pipe too big for any of us to study out. She snickered, so she must have been feeling better. You believe in a god who blows soap bubbles. Then she didn't snicker. How long do we have to go on waiting here? No time at all. We can go whenever you're ready. No, she said. We have to stay. Then we'll stay till one other come. He'll come. Mr. Housen's a despicable man. But he knows about one other. <laughs> she cried out. I only wish he'd come and get it over with. And then her wish came true. The firelight had risen high, and as she spoke, something hacked up behind the rocks on the pool's edge. It hacked up like a wet, black leech, but much bigger by about a thousand times.
It slid and oozed to the top of the rock. And as it waited a second, wet and shiny in the firelight, it looked as if somebody had flung down a wet coat. Then it hunched and swelled and its edges came apart. It was a wet hand, as broad in the back as a shovel, and with fingers as long as the lines of a tin, and as long as the tines of a hay fork. Get up and start down the trail, I said to Miss Anilinda, as quiet and calm as I could make out to be. Don't argue. Just start. Why should I? She snapped out without moving, and by then she saw, too. And any chance for her to get away was gone. The hay fork fingers grabbed a hold of the rock, and a head and shoulder heaved up to where we could see them. The shoulder was like a cypress root humping out of the water. And the head was like a dark pumpkin, round and smooth and bald, with no face, only two eyes. They were green, but not bright green like cat eyes or dog eyes in the night. They were stale, rotten green something spoiled. Miss Annalanda's shriek was like a train blowing for a crossing. She jumped up but didn't run. Maybe she couldn't. Then a big black knee lifted into sight. And all of one other came up out of the bottomless pool and rose straight up before us. One other was twice as tall as a tall man, and it was sure enough true that he had just the one arm and the one leg. The arm would be his left arm, and the leg his right one. Maybe that's why the mountain folks named him one other. But his stale green eyes were too, and both of them looked down at us. He made a sure hop on his big single foot, big and flat as the top of a table, and he put out his hand to touch or to grab. I dragged Miss Anna Linda clear back around the fire. I reckon she fainted, or near to. Her feet didn't work under her. She only moaned, and she was double heavy in my arms the way a limp weight can be. My strength was under tax to pull her toward where I'd flung down my guitar. I wanted to get my hands on her. Might could be a weapon. Its music or its silver strings might be a distaste to an unchancy thing like one other. But one other had circled the fire the other way around so that we came almost in touch again. He stood on his one big foot between me and my guitar. It might be ill or well to him, but I couldn't get it and find out. Even then, the thought of running across Mr. Housen's mark and down the mountain in the night never entered my head. I stood still, holding Miss Anna Linda on her feet that were gone so limp her shoes were nearly about to drop off, and looked up twice my height into what wasn't a face, save for those two green eyes. What have you got in mind? I inquired one other, as if he could understand my talk, and the words, almost in Miss Annalinda's ear, brought back her strength and wits. She stood alone, still shoving herself close against me. She looked up at one another, and she said a couple holy names. One other bent his big, lumpy knee and sank his blattery, dark body down 
and put out that big splay paw of his. The firelight showed his open palm, slate gray and things dribbling out from it in a clinking, jangling little strew at her feet. He straightened up again. Oh, John. And Miss Anna Linda dropped down to grab. Look, he's given us. Tugging my eyes away from one other as I looked at what she held out to me. It shone and lighted up like a hailstone by lantern light. It was the size of a hen's egg. And it had a many little edges and flat faces, all full of fire. Pale and blue outside, and innerly many colors like the soap bubble light in the bottomless pool. She shoved it into my hand and it felt slippery and sticky like soap. I flung it on the ground again. You fool, that's a diamond, she squeaked at me. It's bigger than the Orloff, bigger than the Kohinoor. She scrabbled with both hands for more of the shiny things, then light it up with every color you could call for. Here's an emerald, she yipped, and here's a ruby. John, he's our friend. He's given us things worth more money than... Down on her two knees before one other, she clawed up the two fistfuls of those things he had flung for her to get down and gather. But I had my eyes back on him. He was looking at me. Not at her, he was sure of her. Well, he knew humankind's greed for shiny stones. About me, he wasn't sure. He studied me as I've seen folks to study an animal to see whether to hit it with a stick or slice it with a knife. The shiny stones didn't fetch me. He reckoned to find something that would. Oh, I know how like a crazy tale to scare, scare young ones all this sounds. But there and then, one other was so plain to see and make out the way you could see him was if I was to make a clay image of him and stand it up on one leg in your sight, and it grew till it was twice as tall as you with stale green eyes, one hay fork paw, and one tabletop foot. In a moment there, with no sound, he and I looked at one another. Miss Anna Linda, down on the ground between us, groped and goggled at the stones she scooped up in her hands. Then the silence broke. A drop of water fell. Another. Drip. Drip. Drip like what Miss Anna Linda had dripped into the fire water from the bottomless pool, dripping off one other's body and head and his one arm and his one leg. Then he turned his eyes and mine back to Miss Anna Linda for long enough to spare me for a big jump past him to where my guitar was. He turned quick and swung down at me with his paw like a man swatting a bug, but I had the guitar and I was running backward out of his reach. I got the guitar across me, my left hand on the frets, my right hand a claw on the silver strings. They sang out, and one other teetered on the broad sole of that foot, cocked his head to hark. I started the last judgment song. The old one, the old, the old one. Old Uncle T.P. Henry had taught me long ago it was good against evil things. Three holy kings, four holy saints, at heaven's high gate that stand. Speak out to bid, all evil wait and stir no foot or hand. But he came at me anyway. The charm one serving against one other, as, been, as I'd been vowed to it would serve against any 
evil in the world. One other wasn't of this world. Though, just now, he was in it. He was from the bottomless pool, and from whatever was beyond, below, behind what its bottom had ought to be. I ran around the fire and around Miss Anna Lynn that still crouched down among all those jewels. After me, he hopped like the almightiest, biggest, one-legged rabbit in song or tale. He had me almost headed off, coming alongside me, and I ran right through the fire. That was less fear to me than he was. My shoes kicked its coals as I ran through. On the far side, I made myself stop and turn again. Because I had to face him somehow, I couldn't just run off from him and leave Miss Anna Linda to pay, all alone for her foolishness. He'd stop too, in his one track. The fire, scattered by my feet, blazed up in scattered chunks, and he was sort of pulling himself together and back from it. Drip, drip, the water fell off him. I felt there couldn't be any stand in that dripping noise, so I sang out loud with another verse of the Last Judgment song. The fire from heaven will fall at last on wealth and pride and power. We will not know the minute, and we will not know the hour. One other hopped a long hop back, away from the fire, and away from me, and away from the song. Something whispered to me what I needed to know. From out of the water he'd come. If I didn't want him to get me, to hold me at a price I'd never redeem, the way jewels beyond all reckoning could buy Miss Anna Linda, I'd have to fight him, like any water thing. Fight fire with water, wise folks say. Fire and water are sworn enemies. Fight water with fire. He circled around again, and that time I didn't flee from before him. I grabbed down toward the scattering of the fire. One other's big, flat hand slapped me, spinning away. But my own hand had snatched up a burning chunk. When I staggered back onto my feet, I still held my guitar in one fist, the chunk in the other. I whipped that fire into a whirl around my head, and it blazed up like pure light would. As one other came bending down to me again, I rushed to meet him, and I shoved the fire at him. He couldn't face it. He broke back from it. I jumped and sidewise my own self so that he was between me and the fire and sashayed that burning stick at him again. He jumped back, and his foot slammed right down among the coals. Gentlemen, I hope none of you all ever hear such a sound as he made with no mouth to make it. Not a yell, roar, or a scream, but the whole top of Hark Mountain hummed and danced to it. He flung himself clear of the fire again, hurting and shaking every ounce of him. And then I stabbed my torch like a spear for where his face ought to be. He made a direct hit. I tell you, he couldn't front up to the fire. He couldn't stand it. He just spun around and jumped and then he dived into the water from whence he'd come to us, into the bottomless pool. And the splash he made was like a wagon falling from a bridge. Run to the rocks, I saw him cleave down below there into the deep clearness like a diving one-legged frog. All among the soap bubble colors, getting small. While I watched, so small he looked like a hand size finger size, a bean size, and then the light engulfed him, and he was gone from my sight.
I stepped back to the scattered fire and dropped my burn and shunk. Miss Anna Linda still huddled on the ground. I questioned whether she'd paid all of mine to what had gone on, that scrambling fight. Her hands were grabbed full of jewels, shining green, red, blue, white, all colors. I said nothing, but took her by the arm and pulled her to her feet. She looked at me and waved her both full fists in joy. Get him here, I said. Her eyes stabbed at me, like fish gigs. She couldn't believe I'd spoken such words. I put down my guitar and took her right wrist and pried open her right hand. I tried not to hurt her as I took the jewels. Into the bottomless pool, I plunged them, one by one. They splashed and sank down like pebbles. Don't, John, she screamed. But I took her other hand and pried away the rest of them. Plop, I flung one after the first bunch. Plop, I flung another. Plop, 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 more. They're a fortune, she gabbled, dragging at my arm. The greatest fortune ever dreamed of. No, ma'am, I said misfortune. The greatest misfortune ever dreamt of. But no! Plop. Plop. I flung him in. The last of the jewels. What were you ready to pay for? Anything. She said as if she was tired out. Anything. You mean everything. If he paid high for us, he meant to have his worth from us. He needs folks of this world to serve him. More folks than just Mr. Housen. I pointed into the bottomless pool for her to look down there. I hope and pray he stays now. The things are more comfortable than what taste I gave him. She looked down to where the bottomless pool had no bottom. John, you're right, she said as if she talked out of a dream. Those colors do look like the tints of a soap bubble, stretched out, with nothing beyond its film of suds that we can imagine. A great big unthinking soap bubble, like the one you said God blew. Might could be so, I said. Now, it could be there's more than this one soap bubble we're in. A right many soap bubbles. Each one a life. And a universe strange to this one we're in. The pain of that new thought went into her like a knife and made her silent. Now, it could be there's two soap bubbles touching. And the spot where they come together is where something can leave the one and come out into the other. She sat down. The new thought was weight as well as pain. She moaned in herself. Some born adventurer dares to try to move into the new bubble, I said, through whatever matches the bottomless pool on that far side. In the other life and universe. Maybe. I say. There's God's great plenty of maybes about it. No maybes. She said all of a sudden. You saw him. No such creature was ever born into our world. Anything looking like that must be. You still don't understand. And I shook my head. I don't truly reckon he'd look like that in his own soap bubble. He makes himself look that way to be as possibly much like our kind he meets in our world. We can't guess what he'd naturally look like. I don't want to try to guess. And she sounded near about to cry. Such a stranger needs friends and helpers in the new strange world. 
Some things he knows from his own home are lack power here. Power we think is witch stuff. He'll pay high for helpers like Mr. Housen. He'll pay high for us. Will he come back? Not right on. I picked up my guitar. Let's grope down trail in the dark, so if he does come back, he won't find us. Somewhere below, we'll build a fire, and in the morning, get all the way down. John, said Miss Annalinda, talking fast, you were right about me. My spell was to get you up here for spite, but now if you don't have anywhere to go... I've got everywhere to go, I said. As soon as I get you down, I'll go everywhere. It's not spite anymore, John. It's love. She said that word as if she'd never said it before. It's love. I love you, John. She maybe didn't even know that she was lying. And I wanted to stop her. You know... I changed the subject. There's one more thing about this soap bubble idea. The bubble we live we live in keeps on a stretching and a swelling. But one soap bubble can't last forever. Sometime or another it stretches and swells so tight. It just bursts. That did what I was after. It stopped her flood of words. She started up and off and all around. I saw the whites of her eyes glitter in the last glow of the fire. Burst, she said slowly. Then what? And then nothing. When a soap bubble bursts, it's gone. And we had silence to start our climb down Hark Mountain.